Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a special pleasure to be back. And in a sense, I'm back here to, uh, to uh, bring you up to date on the presentation that I made last year, uh, because that was in October 2014. Uh, that's the time of year when things start to get cold and the heating season begins. So after we had left Ottawa last year, winter came on, the season of big gas consumption begins. Then we came into the spring. The summer is kind of the dead period. Uh, and now we're at that point again in October. And we're asking ourselves once again, will Ukraine make it through the winter? And I'll have some slides in a moment about that that will give you I think a big picture that is on the whole reassuring as the, uh, as the uh, as title suggests, so far so good for now. Uh, and uh, in uh, Russian that would be пока нормально, но пока. And I gather that the, you can get away with saying that in Ukrainian as well, except you have to say поки. That's, that's the extent of my Ukrainian, I, alas. Um, but first I thought I'd begin with a couple of words about why natural gas is important to the rest of us and those of us in this room. We're very far away from language policy here. And so there are really three points that I think are very crucial and relevant for all of us. One of them, of course, is the bit that we all care about, and that is natural gas as a source of heat and light. Uh, if Ukraine is short of gas this winter, why people could freeze in the dark, not pleasant, and of course that's something that is very basic. So the first question is really, will Ukraine make it through the winter without some sort of crisis that will be, be, uh, bring discomfort or will aggravate the economic and budgetary crisis that is, um, as we know, abroad in Ukraine? The second reason that natural gas is important for us is that it is a very important part of Russian-Ukrainian relations and also of Russian-European relations. It happens that Ukraine is the transit country between Russia and Europe, and consequently this has given Ukraine leverage, arguably leverage that has been part of the rent, swap, uh, rent swamp. Sorry. Uh, I think a, a brilliant coinage, by the way, that's, that's great, a, a rent swamp. Um, if it hadn't been for the leverage that came from having the pipelines that the Russians have to use on the way to Europe, why Ukraine would not have been able to get those rents and the story would have been considerably different. Uh, the Baltic is why you've made relevant comparisons to the ba Baltic and that's why those are so important in particular. Uh, so the second question is how is that transit role evolving and what is happening to that leverage that Ukraine has used and misused? Because again, I think one has to emphasize that we're talking here when we talk about the Russians and the Ukrainians, we're talking about co-conspirators or at least co-conspirators among subgroup, some subgroups on both sides. Uh, the third thing that is so important is precisely what Margarita Balmaceda has just been talking to you about, namely, the, the, the role of natural gas as a, an, the single most important, and Anders Osland has emphasized this point, the single most important source of rent, rents, and therefore the single most important source of the creation of oligarchs and funny business and funny money uh, in Ukraine over the past 25 years. Um, I can't resist just taking a moment to pick up quickly on your theme Margarita, that is to say the question of whether Ukraine is still a rent swamp in the area of gas. And I just want to point to something that I think is very important here as we take the long sweep of the last 25 years. There are some long cycles here that are at work that have brought us in 2015 to a very different state from where we were in 1991-93. You begin in, I'm going to, two, two points to the movie here, so I'm going to jump back and forth between the two. 91, 93, you're in a world of barter. And barter is, is by definition, funny business, right? 
Now we're in an era of conventional money. Both economies have become very substantially monetized, and that is a world of difference, number one. Number two, that means you go from informal to far more formal, to more conventionally commercial, regulated by contracts. The key date is 2009, when for the first time, Ukraine and Russia signed a conventional European-type gas contract in 2009. That is a key marker. Three, you start out in 91, 93, and into the 90s with a triangular relationship. It's Russia, Ukraine, and lest we forget, Turkmenistan, which is the funniest place of all. And among the corrupt deals that get made, the Turkmens are very much part of the deal. But you go from there to bipolar. And so I'd better quit. Otherwise, I will not be able to show my slides. But you see how excited I am by the question that you, you raise. So let me take you quickly then through five minutes worth of these slides, and that's all I need because you'll get the headlines right away. Um, we were expecting a crisis. We didn't get a crisis. We were, what we got was survival, and that is what we're getting again in 2015. That is the result of some fundamental changes that are taking place. One of them is that gas production by independence has continued to grow, and two in particular, but the question there I'm going to leave you with, and I'll spare you the details of the slide, is taxes, taxes, taxes. It's tax legislation, and particularly the tax legislation that the RADA is now ducking from, that is going to determine whether independents are able to continue producing. Number two, there has been a dramatic in, a de a decline in imports from Russia, substitution with, with um, imports from Europe. That is crucial. The only problem is they come in in the west, and most of the pipelines run east to west. So how do you get European gas to Kiev? We, maybe we can talk about that. There is some magic ways to do it, but they require co tacit cooperation from Gazprom. Then as you go forward, the key point is storage, and we're still three BCM short of a decent filling of the storage uh, uh, reservoir. So insofar as there is a question mark and some worry, it is whether the Ukrainians are going to use the balance of this month to be able to finish getting ready for winter. So there is still a question mark out there. Gas consumption in Ukraine has gone way down. This is both good news and bad news. The bad news is this, this is a byproduct of declining industrial production, particularly in the East. On the other hand, the good news is that we're finally starting to make a headway in cutting household consumption through a very drastic increase in domestic prices. Where we're not making headway is in heat, where the present coalition has ducked from mandating the price increases that it was supposed to. It's got to do that. And also heat is where the leakage is still occurring, and that is one place where there may be some funny money running to interested parties. Crucial question here, and I'm down to my 30 seconds here. Gas transit through Ukraine, which is what gives Ukraine its leverage over the years and the opportunities for those rent gains, gains to interested parties, the transit is declining. And this is a byproduct of a Russian strategy. 20 years ago, the Russians said, we can't depend on Ukrainian transit. We're going to bypass Ukraine. Gazprom had the money to do it since they had lots and lots of legacy gas. They monetized that and built pipelines with it. So now there are more pipelines than you could possibly want. The Russians have pipeline capacity to Europe from now till hell freezes over. That is a byproduct of a policy designed to bypass Ukraine. It's down to 40% transit now. If the Russians are able to build Turk Stream, it'll go down to zero. I would submit, by the way, that even though it's fashionable to say, oh, those bad Russians, they're cutting out the Ukraine. No, this is actually a very good policy because it will cut out the Ukrainians from any leverage over gas transit. And that will succeed in making the relationship even more commercial as it goes forward. And that's what you want. Finally, Russian-Ukrainian gas supply agreements are now at lower prices because gas prices are still largely tied to oil prices, and oil prices have done what you have been reading about. And consequently, gas is a good deal if you're a consumer. It's a very bad deal if you're a gas producer. And Gazprom is in deep financial trouble. 
This, of course, makes them better behaved. Lastly, on the question of, did I say lastly before? I think I did. But anyway, <laughs> lastly, lastly, really lastly, no kidding, no fooling, is the fascinating question of whether Ukraine is going to partition into two different gas markets. And so here you have a map of some funny business that happened over the winter, some funny business that was actually probably good in its result. Gazprom started sneaking gas into the separatist held areas through those two places where you see those two red arrows there. Those were, those were little used pipelines that NAFTA has maybe even forgotten about. And all of a sudden, gas starts to appear in the separatist areas. S some pretty substantial volumes, maybe 400 million cubic meters. That's not enormous, but it's enough to keep the uh, area going, especially since the industrial consumption is way down. It kept the lights on and the heat, heat going in the occupied areas. Well, who's paying for that? Nobody knows. Basically, the Russians, Gazprom said, you, Naftohaz, it's your territory. You're going to pay for it. Naftohaz says, Naftohaz says, like hell, we didn't nominate gas going into those two areas. You pay for it. Finally, last spring, both sides agreed, we're not going to talk about it. <laughs> and, and so what we have is this kind of agreement to disagree, not to talk about who's actually supplying gas to this region. And one final point, this would not be possible unless the Russians had actually tacitly been willing to go along with a lot of these things. The Russians could have made life a whole lot more difficult for the Ukrainians over the past winter than they actually have. And the same is true, by the way, in Russian-European gas relations. The heretical thought is that the Russians are actually interested in kind of cooling this relationship and making sure that it doesn't blow up as it seemed it might do at this time last year. So qualified good news, пока нормально, пока.